me have my people them are loyal to me. Zane? Mm-hmm. And do not have the people them are loyal to him. Two are we young and two are we have ego. Zane? So if do not show up at the studio one time when I expect him to show up, me not just a, 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 a hold it down a little bit and I try to deal with it for a militancy. I take a different approach. I take a bad up approach. Why? I can't deny Bounty still because I only for people who encourage. Bounty said to me, yo, scatter, you're fine. Don't do nothing more. This is it. Don't sell nobody. I already him. Even though I do not agree with the path that I've been taking, mm-hmm. I have to say we have to give the youths them a chance. Now, from aspiring music engineer to billboard charting producer, Cordell Scatterborell has cemented his place in dancehall's history. He is an acclaimed music producer, audio engineer, musician, songwriter, don't own records executive, and entrepreneur. Throughout his career, Scatter has played a significant role in promoting Jamaican music on a global scale and has been involved in numerous successful projects. His 2003 world-renowned Coolie Dance Rhythm, which earned him the title of Billboard Charting Producer, was recently featured on Beyonce's Renaissance Tour. Coolie Dance was also featured in several films and television productions among them we're talking about zero dark 30 and the popular u.s television show america's next top model and today we're absolutely elated to be journeying with none other than cordell scatterborell on the road to success scatter welcome grateful Respect, Kashima. What makes this conversation special today, Scatter? You have done numerous interviews, but guess what? You're always talking about issues. You're always talking about the industry. And today we're here to talk about you. So this is what makes it special. You rarely talk about yourself. Yeah, I'm very new to this part now. So you bear with me. You know, I'm going to try to recollect as much as I can. All right, so let's just let's kick things off with your foundation. Um, let's talk about Cordell Burrell. Um, where did you grow up? How would you describe your childhood when you reflect? Wow, well, I grew up, um, as far as back as I can remember, I remember my mom being around. Let me see, my mother's name is Iselin Burrell, she, she's married, of course. But when I, the first memory I have is being called Icy Fractal because they used to walk behind my mother and hold up on the end of her skirt. Yes. You know, from my uncle, they used to call me Icy Fractal. But I don't remember my father because my father skipped on probably at the age, probably when I was four or three years old. And mm-hmm. it, was, it was six of us with, with, with her mother, and she, she it was a struggle for her. So, growing up, I remember going to a basic school in Grand Spread on Charlotte Road. Um, that was the church that my mother went to. I remember going to that basic school, and then I remember my mother not being around because she left Jamaica to move to Canada just to make it better. But um, we had to go and live in uh, um, Grand Spread, a place called uh, Adman, you know, with one of her church sisters who had. Um, I don't even remember how many how many kids that church sister had. She had about eight kids of her own mm-hmm. and a one-room house. Wow. And, I, and, I, and to this day, I don't understand how, <laughs> how we, we ended up staying in that one room with eight or nine other persons. <clears throat> um, majority of them older than us, me and my, me and my siblings. And I was the second to last one. So I had a younger sister and then four bigger brothers and uh, four, four, um, like three other sisters and one brother. So we were there and it was very tough. I res- the lady name is Miss Samuels. It was her church sister, Sister Samuels. And uh, my mother wasn't there anymore. And at the age of probably five, I remember for the first time learning my ABCs with um, Sister Samuels' son, a, a-, a virgin named Tommy. And him couldn't understand why I always make this mistake of saying hello men of PE. You know what I say? Yeah. Hello men of PE. That was my first recollection of actually learning because I never grew up as studious as I wanted to be. You know, mm-hmm. looking back now. So that was the first recollection of learning. And then I, they, they, they checked me into childhood practice in school. My other sisters and brothers went to New Day all age. You know? 
So mm-hmm. I remember walking from Admin Lane to Shortwood School every day. You used to get, used to, one time you used to get 50 cents for lunch. And then one time we not get no lunch, but we still have to go to school every day, same way. But good thing we did have the Nutribun and the, the, the milk and them something, mm-hmm. there, you know? Yeah, balancing. <laughs> quite forget it for care of as well, you know? So, um, yeah, that was that was the start. That's the f- as far as I can go back. And I remember mm-hmm. being introduced to, to ghetto liberty, the garrison liberty with bigger food that run up in the lane, whole heap of time, you know what I say? Mean? If outside the 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 soldier them the bad man them and them thing there so growing up in Adman Lane that's where I I I, I kind of get you no know, the exposure of you no know, you and your own as a youth you have to go learn from the streets you have to go do what you have to do for for survive and learn about good company and bad company going to school and so forth you know so from a very young age you now you you start develop a uh, 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 isolated attitude that you know it is up to you because I can't look to my sister them for certain type of street guidance and no man wasn't around much. Uncle them used to drop in on them every now and then, but you know, but it was on you as a youth to learn from the streets and raise mm-hmm. yourself. Yeah. Did you? Did you? Because you went from being your mommy's frock tail to her, you know, going away to make ends meet. Um, how were you able to adjust to this change, even though you know, um, the church sister was there for you and your family? Um, did you understand what was going on, and 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 did, were you in need of your parents? Were there moments that you felt like, boy, you need mommy? At the mo- you see, at the moment, I had no choice but to address. I couldn't cry, and I couldn't mm-hmm. cry about. It mommy or anything it just it is the cards that you dealt at the moment at a young age because we've seen a lot of young kids lose their parents and they still have to push further mm-hmm. the only it hits you i think at a later age when you need to have certain serious conversations or a certain type of nurturing and it is absent like the first day of a new school or a new term everybody's parents is there you're there alone you know and uh, you're like, emptiness that it is dear and you don't know how you go. Like, why me? You know, you said that to yourself, but you know, not, you have no choice but to try on. And um, the lady who we lived with, I mean, she did her, her very best, you know. Mm-hmm. And, um, I must say, looking back now, I still don't understand how she did it. I remember sitting around, around a, a, a Sunday table <clears throat> and there was one egg and two dumplings and or there was callaloo. Kalalu and me can cook for one feed for myself now. Used to share for 12 people. You know? Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. Bungla Kalalu, can buy a bungla Kalalu now. And cook it myself. I eat all I eat in a one sitting. But that used to serve for 12 people and mature adults and kids all at once. And one, wow. not even one loaf of bread. Me alone can eat one whole of bread by myself <laughs> in a one. Mm. Half a bread or quarter bread used to share the entire family them time so you, you, you wonder how you make it through or how you live with the circumstances that are the hands the cards that you were dealt and it became it's like a tool or a teaching tool that you use to acknowledge where you're coming from we just always feel fortunate no matter what you go through mm-hmm Absolutely. Um, so so yeah. here it is, you mentioned um, school a little bit. Let, take us to the classroom, Cordell Borrell. Um, what yeah. type of students were you don't, and what did you enjoy don't, about don't, school? Don't. <laughs> what? <Don't. laughs> you know what I'm yeah. done, so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, tell you what I'm um, Okay, I, can, I, can, I remember all of this, like yesterday. Going into mm. the start childhood practice in school, when I go home, I never have nobody say, go take up your book. I never have nobody mm-hmm. say, homework none of that i don't even know if me did go school with booking on my bag but me used to go to school and then alone me sitting in the class and it's just idleness straight idleness the turning point came when at the age of probably nine years old i had an aunt by my father's side that i've never met before because i don't know nobody from my father's side and this aunt at the time i never know anybody and this aunt she's called auntie bev and um she came to Jamaica and she decided to visit her nieces and her nephew that she has never really met before. And um, it was my father's younger sister. And she came and she saw our living conditions, right? And um, she was an astonished. She felt ashamed. Mm-hmm. 
Wow. And I had another brother at the same time that was not affiliated with us, was my half brother, my, my father's son as well, living in another area in Grand Spain. And she went and she visited his conditions and she didn't like it as well. And she took it upon herself to rent a house for all of us. And she went abroad and she put all that in place and she rent the house and she said, my, my half brother now with his mother and two daughters came and we were all living in that house. So it was six of us, me and my sisters, and my brother, half brother, Damien Burrell, and his mother and his two sisters, we were all living in a, what was it, a one, two, three, four bedroom house. What? And that's our... Yes, yeah, that's off like, mm-hmm. Rochester Avenue and uh, 35 Rochester Avenue. That's off Manningsville Road, and that was my first experience at living in a big house, uh, uh, you know, and big living room and nice furnitures and big yard space and so forth. And this woman, Miss Catherine, that's my brother's mother. She had one style: go take up your book every time she see me. Go take up your book, you mm-hmm. know. I'm a theater, you know, them kind of me, so you despise the woman, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm book, more about my freedom, you know. But I realized the influence that it had because it, my brother, half-brother Damian Burrell, was brilliant, you know. And unfortunately, my aunt who made all of these preparations and put all in, you know, in place for us, she died like a few months after because she had sickle cell. Oh, Wow. Yeah, so we were back to struggling, but we, we had a roof over our head, and them time that the man we, we, we rent the house from, I don't know, come like him, him, him remember same own a house every now and then, probably every five months, and come check in for some rent. So we were able to go on and sustain for like three to four years in that house, hardly paying any rent, but able to find food. And them time this Western Union did start work now, where you could have get one code, and my mother would have sent one fifty dollar. And my sister them could have pick it up. So we're always able to eat. And we're fortunate about that. But the, the real irony about this situation is, remember, me tell you something, done. So mm-hmm. my mother now did have to find a way for me to get educated because we start had regular phone calls now to catch up and see how we're really doing. So my mother was a friend of this lady called Miss Wells. She taught at a school named Don Robin Prep. Now, it is based on Miss Wells, the, the link with Miss Wells now that my mother got to enroll one, two, three, four of us, my little sister, my bigger brother, Everton, and Damian, my half brother. All of us ended up in Dunrobin Prep. My sister came after, but all three of us ended up in Dunrobin Prep at, the, uh, at that time. Now I had two chances to pass, um, a common entrance. Mm-hmm. Uh, my brother was in gear three. And then me was in grade five, Miss Wells' class, because I needed special attention. So they put me in that grade, and then um, the, the common entrance thing run and fail for the first time. But they only have two chances, because my born January, them say, I think it have to do the time anymore. So and they had two chances. Mm-hmm. Your so age. My brother get you, pass for JC, whoop, gone, left me, mm. left me in the class by myself. I feel done like, like, like hell, you know? <laughs> so... Like my, my the teacher had a serious talking to me. I said, Cordell, you have nine months to catch up with this class. You're going to have to get serious. Every day after school, you're going to come to my house for some extra class because she had extra class that she didn't. Um, if anybody were living in Patrick Cities, them, them here at Dwayne Park side, know Miss Wells. So every day, you know, I used to take the exterminator bus, I used to wait on the sexy bus, them, the Prince Macha Perry bus, them, and drive, go down at Dwayne Park and go to Miss Wells Yard. And um, what I did hard for me, just to learn some simple tools and mental ability and so forth, was very hard. It was a struggle, but I started catching up, you know? Mm-hmm. And I really like English, and I really like um, the, the, the writing compositions and so forth. So I acknowledged my strengths. So I started working on it. Don't say about where my was concerned, but work with the, the strengths that I have. And lo and behold... <laughs> When um the common entrance results come out and my pass for a school named Calabar, mm. that was the great achievement for me at that time. Wow. We all have achievements, but that first achievement for me to achieve something as great. You see your parents jump and carry on when them mm-hmm, the kids mm-hmm. see, I felt elated, like wow, I have a purpose, I can actually do something, you know. 
And Calabar dance school them time there. My brother there, JC and me there, Calabar. Wow, what a balance, you know? And then my little brother, Damien, first go him go, in pass fades, judges, you know? Oh, wow. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it, it is the fact that we were growing up in our home now where there are certain balance where you had Miss Caption mm -hmm. reminding us to take up our book every minute. And then, you know... We, we could have did stay in uh, no, no, on the road, no, up in the lane and uh, 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 do some crazy things because we, do, we get in uh, some serious trouble at some young at a young age, you know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. uh, under age, why I never end up in a certain institution. So we were safe right there. And then, um, you know, you start to collaborate and start flex as a youth now, you get your independence. And you're not even care so you, have, you know, have a mother or a father because you have your friends, them, and you find solace around the company that you keep, you know? And that's where the, everything started to shape. Uh, though I'm getting to the part of how the, how the music comes into play because I prefer you to ask that question. Yeah, no, man, I'm, I'm definitely going to ask it. But I know um, after high school, you had gotten into construction. So after leaving Calabar, oh. no. Oh, you remember that? Wow. Look here, I'm going to do some digging, you know, because, and can I tell you something? I really had to dig because you don't talk about yourself as much. So take, take us from high school to you doing construction and what actually led you into, in, into that field. Well, um, construction started based on my family. I had an uncle named Leroy Robinson. Mm -hmm. he, 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 he was like a foreman on a lot of these sites in and around Kingston. He was a foreman on a, on a, on a site at where the, the flow building is at, that white building right at, uh, in front of Oxford Road. And then he was one in, a, in my community of um, Cancer Spring Gardens when all these apartments were being built. We were broke, so we never have money. So whenever no food in the cupboard, I could have just walked up on a site where my, my uncle um, I'd, I'd do this kind of work. And he would have given me a food for go cook some food for the family, you know. Now, now at, at my last year of Calabar, I did a farm food. Because for three years straight, I go to school and I pay no school fee. No money never did it. And we did a fair skip majority of the class. And when you don't pay school fee, you're not supposed to be in the class. So for all three months straight, I only got two class. But I still go to wow. go school. And they on the play field or farm food or talk and foolishness, you know. Just a try to find yourself as a youth. So, my, 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 my sister was dating this guy. My sister was going to church as well, but she was dating a really nice guy named Neville White. And one evening, he come and say, Yo, drive with me, go over my house. And they have one BMC Oxford and live in a Spanish town. And I drive with him. And, and the way over him, I raise with me, I say, Your sister worried about you because know, you're going in the wrong direction, youth. And you need to know where you're doing your life. Is either you're going to stay in a school and waste your time or you're going to find a trade and find something to do with your life. For, for, for. Steer yourself and be a man. Them times I never yet have somebody who give me a talking to you. Know? So that was strange for me. You know, for somebody mm -hmm, at the time. Mm -hmm. so you what you do with your life? Ask yourself that question there. And you have your sister them around you. And as a man, you have to be a duty to look out for them. But you can't do it if you're going to be on the negative side of things. You know? So that conversation resonated with me. I mean, no, so I never did a go on good in that school for achieve nothing. So I did really think so I need to go find a trade. So I asked my uncle if he could uh, give, me a, give me a work on the site. Mm -hmm. and said, That's how that happened. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I went so, to get, so, and when I come on the site, he treat me like any ordinary person. One of the time, um, we did run around one corner of farm full and I only see somebody come around and I see a big, big stone after about five away. And I'm my uncle wow. stone the whole because we are waste time on him side and lick man in them side and I wiggle out you and get her. So it was like I was a privilege to be on the side, but I was privileged to have the opportunity to try and make something in my life. So I did I make some money and I carry things, carry to them and I be able to put food on the table. So that was my first knock with construction. I, I got into it later on in the music business, you know. But mm -hmm. um I had a lot of disappointments with it, a lot of par partners that didn't see the full um, potential. So it is only now that I, it is bearing fruit at this age. It is only bearing fruit now. Um, and it is based on the guidance of a good, good virgin that I have that also heals from Ocherius. Um, I know he's not somebody who like to load him up, but I'm going to load him up now. He's in name Brad. 
a Jack Ruby son. Okay, and yeah, I, we know Brad. Right. Yes, and, and Brad is the whole person who come and lift me up and say, Scatter, dust off, man. This is how you apply yourself in another world, and this is how it is done, and so forth. Because me and Brad are followed from way back when I'm used to the James Avenue, I do the tattoo thing, and, and so forth. Mm-hmm, you know what I say? Mm-hmm. Long time. Yeah, them no. time I used to manage the sound name Cinemax or Ochoa. So it's a whole heap of things. You know? so, and and, and now we, no, we're getting into the musical aspect now. So let us just get into that. Um, how were you introduced to music? Because before we get to Scatter, who wanted to become an artist, let's talk about um, your introduction to music. Oh, well, this is a great question. And you, you, you may find it weird because, you know, I, I'm not so great with the religious community. But mm-hmm. I must say, it was me sitting in church. <laughs> a church at, at Grand Spen called United Pentecostal Church, right? Because we did have to go to church on Sunday morning time and youth meeting on a Tuesday and Bible studies on a Thursday. I remember everything. Now, sitting in church on a Sunday and sitting at the front bench, you fall in love with the players of instrument. Like, my superhero was a man named Cleve who played the drums. Because mm-hmm. just see this guy beating the drums and he in a steady groove and doing the greatest thing with the crashing and I do the rolls and so forth. I was in awe. So me and about three of my virgin them sit down and imitate him. Every Sunday night, we bring our own stick and play with power. We need, we need them. You said, then talk my answer and finish. You know? So that is where my passion for music started to grow. Because, you know, the church... I want one of them lazy church. I want one of them energetic church where music is a fundamental part of it. So being in an environment like that, your love for music grow, your, your passion for people and the vocals and the singing and the songs and so forth. And then, you know, the, the Sunday morning where, where you listen to the, the music, them, you, you're preparing to go to church and have gospel music are blaring in your ears. So my love for music started there. It never started in a dance hall. It never started by going to listen in to In the church. Wow. started in and and I ended up getting baptized mm-hmm. the same as Mark Myrie Bujo Banta because he ended up going to that church as well. That's where I know Bujo from. Oh you know? wow. Yeah, so me and Bujo baptized the same night at, at North Kingston Pentecostal Church. You know, him 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 was talking to the Lord anytime him see me. That's why him, him always run back from. So yeah, a lot of us as musicians hone in on our talent. And it started right there in the church. And I can give it up to the church for that because I don't know where, I don't know if I'd be this great at what I do because it is great when you can latch on to what you love and what you have a passion, passion for at an early stage. Mm-hmm. You know, so any, you're a parent, now you have a child and you seem to have a love for something. You, it is on you to ensure that he has the opportunity to hone in on it and develop mm-hmm. that skills at all. Did, did you eventually started playing drums in the church as well? Yes. They they saw the dedication. Mm-hmm. A lot of people fell off. I never fall off. I came coming every day. And I and on the first time they they them said, go sit down and do something. Now. It was the church with empty. And I was and I and I played the first song. And I was pretty steady, you know. So mm-hmm. after that, every now and then when Cleve was missing or when I'm tired or I'm not in the mood. I get to play the job. No, in the late nineties, um, your aspiration was to become an artist. And um, tell us about this dream and what caused you to refocus and look at production. Full story, because um, going to Calabar, I used to, I used to say, um, "Baby Sham." Um, they used to have DJ contests, right? And you used to say, like a big crowd, a big circle farm, and you used to have this one little brown youth. Mm-hmm. Ah, a, with every title and baby sham used to dj like the body was the baddest thing and baby sham the maga skinny them days <laughs> mm-hmm. when you see the circle farm around him and him a dj and him and you know say yo that you just bad you know so uh we, we started beating the desk in class because we are emulate them and them baby sham them in a bigger grade that way higher farm that way so mm-hmm. we are emulate them Dexter in the classroom and a DJ and so forth. And I got the opportunity now to be around someone who was coming from a musical background. One of my virgin called Bensley Hype, Hemsley Morris. Mm-hmm. His father, Hemsley Morris, you know, 
Well, he had a big song back in the 80s or early late 70s. So Benzie lived on Hillary Avenue, probably still lived there until now. Um, he lived on Hillary Avenue and that was on the way from Calabar to go to my house. So every evening would have stopped this time with their Bensley house and in father they have a little studio and would have been able there for just a fool around and I make beats and a DJ and a so forth. So me and Bensley used to write song together and DJ and so forth. And I and and Norrisman now used to live with him, Hantic and Norrisman couldn't live in Hannah Town anymore. So him did have to move, come up town at a point and stay around him, anti around the road from us. So me and Norrisman and Bensley. Uh, and a youth named Gandhi, now known as Raskasa. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yes, you have to walk mm -hmm. up and down and, 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 and do the thing, you know? So I have to give it up to Bensley for that because that's where now I decided I wanted to be a DJ. Mm -hmm. problem, problem was now, Calabar is done. Could have graduated or not, so I have to left school. School done. So a big man time come now. Oh, you have to survive. Oh, you have to take care of yourself. Now I know where to live now because by them time they we can't live up town no more, we can't pay the bills. So I have to move, go to um out of Mountain View, um uh, off Langston Road, between Langston Road and GX Road, go live with my uncle named Errol. <coughs> so I was living out by my uncle, and him, uh, and then my other uncle who lived there said to me, You can't come here so I know I do nothing. So in can I go to one bridge in where one a mechanic shop and say, Yo, I want you give my work. And the man said, no problem. Half a year militancy, I'll give you a try. So every morning, 7 o'clock, I have to find myself around at the man's place and wash up, the, clean down the equipment, then clean up the area for work and just be an apprentice and learn mechanic. And I did it, I did it for about uh, seven months. Mm -hmm. The man named Mr. Rabbi. Mr. Rabbi. A DJ named Frankie Sly, they live up the road from, from Mr. Rabbi. So he was a DJ. So I always see artists eating on my psych, eating on my psych every now and then. I can't get rid of it. You know, so Frankie said, they have this song, you must say, I'm Belance, I'm Radio Care, every time, you know. So he used to, he used to love how him dress and, you know, put himself together as a DJ and so forth. But me still there, I do my mechanic work. And when me under the car, me a DJ more time and I do my thing. But, you know, me have to stick with the work. So one summer now, like, me go country for the summer. And when me come back from country, party out the whole summer country, and I decide to say, yo, me now go back, go do no mechanic work, you know. I want better for me, I want something else for myself. I can't yeah. say, I want something for myself. So, Bensley linked me one day now. And and before I go back out of East, I end up at Steer Bensley Yard for about one good three months. Me and Raskasa with their Bensley Yard at Bleach. I had in my father's studio at night time and I sleep. And him father and him mother don't know, say, they have two youth where I stay in them house. Bensley Yard. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bensley Yard gave the opportunity to stay in my house. About three months straight, you know. So Benzley, I go to the studio one day now. I say, I'm get a link on the studio. And I, I say, yeah, man, I roll. I um, we'll go with him. Me go with him. And then um, that studio, pretty. It was the most unique studio I've ever been to because I used to have brush with a few studios before that and I couldn't get in. But this studio, I got in. Studio named Celestial Sons of Mullines Road, Mullines Plaza. So Benzley was the real DJ and the crew. I was just trying. You know, mm -hmm. the, the man make everybody uh, everybody audition. The bridge name Steve Ventura, and Benzley audition and pass with flying colors. And I say, yes, you are part of the camp. I'm me DJ, but I have no voice. No voice. Benzley was in Innocent Crew. This is yes, I remember for Innocent mm -hmm. Crew. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I have no voice. That was probably 1996. Yeah. I have no voice so for carrying a note or for sound like a real DJ, but I have some lyrics. But <laughs> lyrics, you never have to have much lyrics in days. So I get worried now when the man not even, the man not even give me two glances. So after I come out, I say, yo, am I really cut out for this? You, lo you, you know, it's, a lot of people have love for music and want to be a part of the, 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 this venture. But if, if you don't belong in it as a player, it is very important for you to acknowledge it at an early stage so you don't waste time. It's a mm -hmm. very harsh statement, but I can make the statement because I've seen a lot of people um, invest their entire life in it. And um, achieving something does not have to be from a wealth perspective. It can just be able to, to make a song that is as carry some weight and offer some form of satisfaction within yourself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't even get that. So I was, I was at a crossroad in a way I was saying to myself, Dude, you really make for this thing? 
you're really talented or what. But I know some have rhythm and I have groove and I have an understanding of key and music and the love for the intricate parts of music. So I said, if I love this, I need to find a way to be a part of it. So you don't have to be an artist. So I'm big, pretty board there. Mm -hmm. It was like a 56 channel Amec Hendrix board. Full of buttons. Look like one plane or one spaceship. But I said to myself, you know what, I wonder if I can learn that board there. So I said, all right, I'm going to find a way to learn that board there. But the first thing I have to do now is find a way to be a fly on this wall because it's not like that man is going to want to see me back in place again. Mm -hmm. So I remember asking him the evening before everybody leave if, if it's all right from forward back tomorrow just for try to learn something within the music. And him said, okay, fine. He brush brush it off like nothing. Me not see about Probably that thing mm -hmm. that <laughs> Lo and behold, my walk from them time I did a, did a reside with one of my sister who was staying at a house in Haverdale. So I, I, I was, I, I, I never go back out of East. I go catch out of the yard. I early, just leave out in the morning and walk to Mullines Plaza. And I did the virgin come out in the studio. And I just stay downstairs for a little bit. Until I'm going to the studio, I'm going to the studio. I'm standing up in the corner. Quiet as a, as a mouse and I said nothing, just watch. So I did that for a few months and I was learning a lot. But the first time I got to sit around the mixing board now, mind you, know, them time the Benz is gone from him career because Innocent who crew and mash up the place them mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I do, you know, them I do them thing. So nothing not happened for me, but I have a, a place where I can go at the time go learn something. And I remember going to this studio for every day, one suit, one shoes, every day, try to make it as clean as possible and try to present myself to smell good, you know? And that was a task. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was a task. I you're walking on the boiling sun, you can't even buy the other and certain things. So you have to find a way to not be a distraction to people in a them owner place. Mm -hmm. So it did that work for me. I learned and I feel like I'm a part of an organization. Whether you can buy lunch or not, I never care about that. I learned something in that music. And then Norrisman joined me there because Norrisman was a, a prospect in the business. And you said they are a record factory. All of the students, them Norrisman walk go. Him and a man named like um, Predator and Ninja Four, them, you know, Reddell's Road. But Norrisman come out of the studio because he liked the studio and he liked the setting. It's a, pass. it's a place where he could have there and just be at peace. So my first opportunity you now to, to actually start use that board was when Cobra, Cabra got signed to a record label when him did the flex, but him did have this big song named Flingstone. That song there, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know where Cabra gets so much money from, but Cabra same as start a label. And I'm telling you, Cabra, I don't know why I'm come to that studio because we never have no two inch machine. It was a thing named ADAT. But the thing with the ADAT now, you could have done, you could have done a lot of recordings because of some video tape where you just push in and the three machine line up and it give you 24 tracks. So when you run out of track pan one, you just pull out another tape and replace it with another one and you keep on recording. So you could have recorded the entire industry and that's what I ended up doing because when Cabra started my label as I done in the business, everybody show up for record fee. And I just I'm start to learn, learn about artists and who are artists and Maka Diamond and Queen Paula, them Captain Barky, Elephant Man, them when Elephant Man ugly her. <laughs> they, they, they too, but them time the Ellie, you never have mm. not <laughs> mm. Harry Toddler, the whole industry. You see me? Is to show up. And I'm telling you, I got the chance to sit around that mixing board and record all of these artists. Because the man who understood there was the only engineer at the time. So I him, him was glad for no say I'm an apprentice now. We can just put in them time there. And I did it. I record like about Two, three hundred songs. <clears throat> you know? Oh wow! Two, so you knew you songs. knew what you were doing because it sounds to me like you just got thrown into it. Like that was your first hands-on experience. My first hands-on experience. But when you have a knock for something, all you do is mm -hmm. soak it up like a punch. You know, because me know somebody belonging to music at the time. That's why I cut, stop the mechanic work, and I never want to do nothing else but music. And whether I'm going to be a DJ or not, I know somebody's supposed to be a part of this industry because I have a different kind of passion for it. So once I got to stand and be a fly on the wall and watch somebody work, every button I'm touch, touch, merge it in my brain. 
everything we could have registered and registered and him system me did have that zeal and that 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 love for feet so him give me the opportunity and um, wow Cecile came to that somebody from Mandeville brought Cecile to that studio and she came there as a singer but she ended up being the secretary there you know mm-hmm. so she was singing there and being the secretary at the same time because Cecile is very bright you know mm-hmm. and uh I learned about notes because he didn't have the steel label name Star Trail Records now. We record Anthony B, the man Sizzler, them. I'm learning how to take harmony with a man named Mr. Derek Lara from the Tamlins. And them man, they would take one whole day and do harmony, just, just do harmony and all songs. And um, you learn about individual notes and ranges and so forth, you know? And um, just being in that era where you could have witnessed one drop music being made like you'd have um sly and rabbit come in and bill a rhythm right there so in front of you and you see the magic happen and you, you learn the importance of a bass line and you learn the importance of drum and bass and so forth it's a knowledge that you can't just pick up because you get mm-hmm. to see it be put together and it just then would you end up get the two inch tape and the two inch tape you just carry a nice sound and an attitude and the whole music did have a kind of different dynamics to it then. You know what I mean? I said, because I got to see like a sizzler come in without nothing in her brain. But the rhythm put on and sizzler just go around there. So, and every word that comes from his mouth made sense. Every melody that flow, that flow was accurate. So you see the spiritual side of the music that it is embedded in these people. They are made for it. They weren't doing it to make a living. They were doing it because of them. It's, they were chosen mm-hmm. to and, and it, it seemed like it just came natural and flowed so by the time right. you 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 know linked well you knew norris man from before from you know taking us on, on your journey so talk to us about was persistent like your very first um production the very first thing that you did as a in a producer capacity boy kashima there are so many elements that contribute to who i am because then became this man called colin levy aka eilid Mm-hmm. And he was doing a lot in the industry. So he um, was about to give up on music, right? And go back to Canada for a while. And I asked him, say, yo, let me run your label for you while you're gone. You know? Mm-hmm. And he brush it off and say, do what you do. You have access to me tape them, voice who you want, voice, and do what you want. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he left, and I was in touch with him, talking back and forth to him and telling him, say, yo, my voice, the bridge in your voice, whatever. But... Narisman now was always there. And me and Narisman always I make song and I record and I, and I, and I do dub and I write. And we did have this one special rhythm that Sly and Robbie did build, but the rhythm was so nice, you know? And um, I remember Narisman was there and every rhythm was in that studio that Narisman could have write a song for and voice for. But this one special song, the rhythm was playing and he was standing at the back of the studio. And him a keep on a home like three lines on it and it resonate and it was so good. I mean, I tell you, Nakeshima, you seen at them time there, we're hungry. Like, I remember, mm-hmm. I remember, like, one time when um, Norris is a young Rasta, them time there, and I come up in a day. I don't know if you might appreciate me saying this, but our history can't run from our history. Young Rasta followed them time there, and like, days pass and we don't eat. I mean, I tell you, a man show up with a, a box food and a chicken leg. Zane? Mm-hmm. And me say, nice man, beg the man some of the food and bite in the, the, the chicken food. And it's like, like him a shake him head when he do it and he say, yo, I can't believe I asked the, I asked the thing there, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and we know, say, yo, that are struggles. Because, you know, say, when you try to take a part and it's so hard and you're so hungry, you have to eat. You know? Yeah. But Survival. Them, Yes. Right in them time then, Akashima. Nice man, I sing the melody for about a couple of days. So we ended up going to the studio and record the song. And right there when we record that song, we know it was special. Mm-hmm. You know, it was very special. So, um, <clears throat> Cecile, we asked her to come arm under the song. You know, them time that Cecile, I did the, the, the secretary work in the studio. And mm-hmm. Cecile did a wonderful job. If you listen to the song, the harmony them pan it was just so smooth, you know? Well, I know I said the Gideon rough, you know? Yeah. I know I know I get the fight still. Everything. Yeah. Perseverance, you know? I'm telling you, when she did the harmony pan it, it was like, 
another icing on the cake again. And then the last bit of flavor we're throwing at Monday Darks, Bensley. Because Bensley grew up in the music that I'm from Innocent mm-hmm. Boom. See him for a link with the studio. I ask him if he can come full around the keyboard a little bit and just add a little more melody to it. And he find this flute. He play two things, but he find this flute tonight. And then play it alongside Norris Man vocals. I mean, I tell you, the power of instrument, because flute is something that kind of put you in a trance, you know. So when you listen to certain music and you hear that certain instrument helps to make the song what it is. So them time that we are young aspiring engineer, now have no hit song or nothing yet. And that song gave us as um artist and producer, me and Norris Man, gave both of us the opportunity to shine. Because mm-hmm. I remember. Bubba from Star Trail came to the studio one day and we played a song for him and, and him shake him head and say, When you do it, you know. Wow. Song, you know? Yeah. And the song not playing no, no way. <clears throat> and him and him said, When you do it, you know, that song I got put on up on the map. That him said. No, the first opportunity now for me to hear that song on the radio came when Gary G mm-hmm. visited the studio. Big up Gary G, man. Gary G visited the studio one afternoon. I think it was he visited the studio the Friday. Because he, he never played on a Friday. He, he visited the studio on a Friday. And um played the song for him and he tell me, say, it mix it. And I said, no, it no mix it. He said, yeah, I forgot rough mix it off and give it to me. No, I'm not leave without it. Oh wow. Yeah, I sit down and I push up the fader of them and rough mix it and Gary G take it and forget about that. And this Ironically, now the next day, which is the Saturday, at about 11 or so, I'm in the studio, I mix the song, you know, because I said, I need to mix that song. Yeah. And Norris man come beat on the studio door and say, Yo, come listen. Yeah. And on the radio, IRFM, Gary G was playing persistent. You know? Wow. And I put up and I talk over it and I had the best things to say about the song. And then right after that, Mighty Mike call. Somebody and I say, yo, me need that song. Yo. No, send it come. <laughs> yeah, so wow. Mm-hmm. So, when, yeah, so when we mix the song now, me and Aris Man there in the studio and it so sounds so good. I'm going to do a different mix it without anything, but just the, the melodies playing. And Aris Man said, that, that one I'm like, you know. And I send the two of them to Mighty Mike and Mighty Mike said, this is the version I like. So I have to big up Mighty Mike because Mighty Mike introduced that a cappella version with a little flute and so forth to the world and in did bore a hole in the song and trust me, it changed my life. When you produce a song like that as your first hit, because I made a post the other day and I, I highlighted that, you know, you have to be great. You have to amount to greatness because at your very low, your first hit song is a song named Persistent and talking about perseverance and overcoming obstacles and just sticking with your truth and, you know, that level of confidence that that one song gave me a nurse, man, I, I, I don't see how I could have failed in a music because it showed me that I have something to bring to the table. And it all happened when we were at our lowest. You know? Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So, no, that is absolutely an amazing story. And in the interest of time, Scatter, because in between the commercials and hearing your journey and uh, you don't talk about yourself a lot, so we need to hear it. Um, so here it is now, you know, you, you got this big song, you are both, you and Norris man, change your life. Like you, you just underscore, take us now to the Coolie dance rhythm and the inspiration behind this rhythm. And did you in that moment knew you had your hands on a hit rhythm? Okay. Well, um, I can rush through a little bit prior to that. Me and, CS, me and Cecile left the Celestial Sound and our abridger named John McKinley gave us a small studio up by Princeville Plaza, you know, and he said, do anything. So we made our first hit right there when she did, can't you see what I've been going, been going through? through. You know? mm-hmm. yeah, it was me, Cecile, and Merciless write that song. We did a drive, got to the country one day, and Merciless was on par in P them time there. And we, we, two, three hours, we write the song. So that is when me start make a real hit song in a dance hall now because that was our first major hit. Left side did Billy Ready, man. You know, everybody have followed in on a voice and a voice and we start become a household name as a dance hall producer. One hit with him after the next, one after the next, after the next. So I think I go on. Now, I remember going to New York for to visit my mother. You know, I mm-hmm. get to meet my and start travel regular. So I'm going to New York to visit my mother and I bring my drum machine with me because I want to stay close to the music. 
So I go over here and cause the link my bridge name Chops. And Chops are play some PlayStation and so forth and I have on the headphone and I, I fool around and find the beat and find a few sounds and put it together and it sound nice to me. Then you have a, a, a crew now named the crew named, I don't know, but they are part of Sashi. They had a studio in, in Bronx. And mm -hmm. the future Pambo called me and said, I have some bridging and I want some rhythm. And them pay good, so come make some money. So I go over there the night and I build the rhythm and them dog give me a vibes, but I don't like when I build rhythm man, I get a hundred percent from who I work with. You know? Mm -hmm. So when I can build the beat them now, I run off the rhythm them and give them and I run off coolie dance. But I said to them, don't pay me for this one. Because I kinda have some, I feel like I gotta have some plans for it. So don't pay me for this one. It's okay. So when I come back to Jamaica now, um, me and Jaguar par Jaguar used to write a lot of the songs them on the projects that I want to work with. So Jaguar bring in Bounty and make Bounty hear the rhythm and Bounty say, Boy, I can't deny Bounty still because I only for people who encourage. <laughs> Bounty said to me, Yo, Scatter, you find it. You read him them <laughs> bad, but this, this is it, youth. Don't do nothing more. This is it. Don't sell nobody. Come and say, My dog will sell Sasha. I say, You're crazy. Don't sell nobody. I over read him. So, wow. Jaguar, that song, you're good to go to go. You're gone. And the whole industry come voice. I mean, I tell you, like, um, Elephant Man right, Vice about three songs on the rhythm, Sean Paul Ricard, Beanie, everybody voice. And then VP contact me and I say, yo, we need another part to what I read him. So put another juggling because you're going to sell green sleeve one or one one for yourself. You to VP. Then I remember this day like yesterday, you know, um, two, two things happened in space of two days. Joel mm -hmm. Chin. Rest in peace, Joel. Joel linked me and say, yo, you have some girl over here we do a song for the rhythm in a scatter. I mean, I tell you, they in a trouble now because you're going to know what being a hit maker is like because that song they are going to run because we get commitment from MTV and it added to this a playlist and whatever, whatever. It's oh, wow. So, yeah. So man said, prepare yourself. Now, I had this publisher known him, Othman Muckles in all England. He also called me the very next day and said, Strader, I got something to tell you, man. You're about to be so well to be on your dreams. <laughs> now, when somebody I tell you that, you know, because mm -hmm. sometimes I'm all right, can we don't make it. But when somebody tell you, say, you're about to be wealthy, wealthy different from rich, I've been a millionaire. Mm-hmm. When him tell me something he's about to be wealthy now, well, I'm mean, going to know how to take it. But I say, okay, fine. Still, I do my work, do my work and so forth. And I got, the, I remember getting a publishing statement for like 150,000 US dollars one time. Mm -hmm. And I had to drive, I had to drive, go to, to Negro <clears throat> to pick up that money. So I brought two girls with me and um, one of my brethren, Rolex. So we so said, we have to spend the weekend at, at, at Negro, go meet my publisher and him family and him give me my check. I swear, Kashima, so when him give me that check, they said, I'm ready for God town. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't want to spend no time down there. I'm going to take my time drive coming to Kingston. So very, very slow because I don't want me to know no accident. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, remember, I remember when I lodged that check. It's the real first big payoff that I got from work that I did. And it is a staple in my memory to show the power of music as I reflect on where I come from. Mm -hmm. Struggles, you know? And how I stayed true to my purpose because... When I made that rhythm, I was just trying to be different. I never want to repeat myself, and I didn't care about what was running the place. I was just trying to make music. So to see that I was able to find a melody and a groove with some drum and hardly any keyboards or anything, but you create a groove that is so special because even now the thing with that beat, it, it is so catchy just with a boom, 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 boom. And we are able to bring elements together like that to create a lasting vibe in, in our music and so forth. Um, nobody could have told me, say, me never mean for do what I do. You know, I wasn't born for this. So regardless of how all the payments and the payoff and the money goes, it's just great to be a part of something that you can remember that first feeling when you wanted to do it and the opportunities and the disappointments and the perseverance that you had to endure to actually make it manifest and not giving up, you know? Mm -hmm. It means a lot to me. So it makes me very 
spiritual with the music and I, 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 it make me a, lot, a very vocal at the same time, voicing my opinions and a lot of things in the industry because I think there's a side of me that has so much things to let out. You get controversial with the words that you say and the things that you do at the same time because you know that you're not here to just cruise through. Mm -hmm. To just merely exist. And I, and, and yeah. I like that. Like it, that, that puts a lot of things into perspective. Even, you know, the drum pattern in that rhythm that you speak of, your love for the drums, um, what yeah. you observed in the church. Yeah. But your Cooley dance, Lenky Mars Den Duali and Snow Cones applause are all successful, unconventional dancehall rhythms, not the usual. Um, do you think that dancehall is once again at an experimental stage um, why we have the, the, the trap music and should we be patient with this sound? You know what? This, uh, even, even though I do not agree with the path that have been taken, mm -hmm. I have to say, we have to give the youths them a chance to do what they feel is mm -hmm. important. The same way I got, I got the opportunity to experiment and I remember there were deflectors and people saying whatever, you know? And I had to push myself and block out the noise. I realized I can't be a voice against what the youths are doing because I had that opportunity. So we have to kind of see if we can teach them or add value to what they're doing. I think that's what needs to be done. We need to kind of fuse what they're doing with what we know and try move the music forward instead of just being critical and just shunning what they're doing. You know, so the, the music needs help. It needs support. But guess what? Mm -hmm. They must survive and they must make a living. And it's just we for find a way to bridge the gap between the old and the, the, the new absolutely well said um there are so many things we need to talk about because you also got into artist management and, and you know, talk to us about um that relationship with idonia and and how did it how did the fallout impact you know your personal career and also you as a as a as a person i can definitely speak on that because because um i look back at everything now i can proper put a proper perspective on it but when you're caught up in the moment, remember, them time them hot. Them time them, I don't say my height, but my hot, and I just owe myself. I don't owe nothing to nobody but myself. But I saw this youth named Idona DJing downstairs from the studio. He was a part of Goofy Camp. And trust me, talented youth. And I tried with a lot of young artists, and it wasn't working out. And them time them, I invested in myself, I invested in my own talent as a producer. So I wanted to help some other youths, right? So, I remember I'm going to visit Idona one day, buy him house. Some Kayla gave me the link to him, Press K. She gave me the, the, the address and made the link for me. I'm going to drive around and go check in. And um, I show him, say, I'm going to do some work with him. And, you know, he expressed great gratitude at the time. You know, I'm dropping on the middle of the road and I said, thank you, because right now, the thing is wicked out there, you know? So, Idona, I will, I will farm a crew named Gangbang, right? And I'm telling you, them time then now me have fun my, in, my thing myself. When I need when I rely upon nobody. So me have, me have, me have send go to the bank every day. Right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> spend money in the street. Me I buy motorcycles and I'm gonna make sure I buy what I don't have care and me I do everything and me I spend for getting out there because I believe in this you talent. When you see talent, you know and you're sure. And me pick out one plot on the hill for say my house I got there, this and theme house I got there, right? That's all. You know them really? Love mm -hmm. the youth. I love the youth more than my woman because I'm music and I feel a passion in me now. I'm a draw me out, you know? Mm -hmm. I come from nothing and I cut off foot pants and the clocks, but I'm the baddest thing in the DJ. I'm just so inspired and motivated. Every day I dream of how I can put this youth further. I remember when I booked him for the first thing, I lock him up in my apartment and give him some VHS tape with Sting from the past and tell him, watch these tapes and know how to talk to the crowd. And Sting is an unruly crowd, so you have to bad them up, bad up our length too. But you have to step out and deal with the show that way for people to take you serious. And so said, so done, he was great. But then now, when things start go crazy you now, when Vibes Cartel himself come at the studio, and I see my reason with Dona and him a DJ, I don't own a song for him. Cartel a DJ, I don't a song to I don't for show him how good donor is and then kill them send fee man. Everybody send fee man. Everybody have me have my people, them are loyal to me. 
magazine mm-hmm. and doing a lot of people them are loyal to him. Two are we young and two are we have ego. Zin? So if don't want to show up at the studio one time when I expect him to show up, me and just I, I, I hold it down a little bit and I try to deal with it for militancy. Me I take a different approach. Me I take a bad up approach. See mm-hmm. me? Now me can take accountability for my actions in a cause. Back then, me seriously people just take advantage of my kindness and, and, and me lose. You know what I say? But me have, mm-hmm. it is very important for you to understand where you went wrong in the, the investments that you made and the choices that you made in the past. So you don't repeat them. So I have a street credibility where me no want damage. He means an upcoming artist and a lot of people are latching to him in inner ears. See? And the two are where I clash now. Because me now got make it look like I'm a back down to a little youth that I just know from yesterday. And he must say, yo, me a somebody too. And me have a voice mm-hmm. too. So all heap of clashing go on and all heap of fighting and all heap of war go on and me say me a spend my money and me not make no man come make me waste my money. Me a go mash up your place and me a go sue and be a them something and it go on for about a couple months until we exhaust any notion of even moving further working together. And it's just come from both sides. And mm-hmm. then I mean lose the most in, in my mind because I invested a whole heap of money, millions. Mm-hmm. See? But I still have to take accountability. Say, yo, when you have to deal with things on a street level, you have to acknowledge that you have the business at the same time. So you have to hire people to do certain things for you. And just be the producer and still maintain certain type of relationships. I didn't do that. So I wow. lost a lot and, and I, I was heartbroken in the process process because I had to sit and watch Donnie and mash up be a stage show. I find be a hit song and I run the place and know say, yo, I needed plant a seed there, but I'm not a part of the journey again. So that that it that worse than when your woman break your heart, you know. I tell you, you know, you can mm-hmm. get over heartbreak. But you see, when music break your heart, trust it's me, you will jump off a building. You see me? Wow. And yeah, and and trust me, it's car me for, 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 for years. It's car me. You know? Remember, some I, me, me pick up a piece of land when I want two horses for me and him and them something there. You know? mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Nobody could tell me say that now going to manifest. I remember one day when I have an X5 and me do one for drive and, and me do one for drive and I say, do one for drive in and the X5 and step out and come pick up some money and leave. And then I see him drive in and come pick up money for sure again. And when he go away, him have on one of them pants there. One of them cloth lens pants there, but the man four pocket full of money. And when I see him jumping at the truck and drive out, I shake my head and say, wow! Look them and look for success. Because you are, you are witness a youth where you come from zero mm-hmm, and you are part mm-hmm. of this success that I read. Term. So all of them things that play with my head for a while and make me feel like, say, yo, John or you, 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 you mess up. You mess up. You know? Mm-hmm. And, and it, it took it, me a while to throw myself out of the hole. I'm not telling you that. Wow. I, I, I absolutely appreciate the honesty. And Scatter, we are going to have to do a part two because there are so many things that we didn't touch. We haven't spoken about your business, Scatter the Businessman, what you're doing at Downtown Records, at Reggae Sumfest. There are so many elements and you're absolutely private. Scatter the Family Man, real quickly, how do you balance your family life with everything that you do? Well, um, I, where immediate family is concerned, I have a small family, small and I have a son, right? Mm-hmm. Only four years old. I started having kids very late, you know. But he, he, you know, it's just, it's just, I'm just relishing in everything right now and just giving thanks and I have something I can love more than myself and just want to do my best for her to just to be around, to witness him growth and challenges and just to be a part of it, you know. Outside of that, it's just reggae some first. Uh, you don't know me, I manage Aisha, and it's, it's, it, that in itself mm-hmm. is a task. I mean, we have ups and downs with the fraternity, including Bounty Killer and Awoli for others, you know. But that in itself is another story. But it, the work goes on, we keep on doing what we can do for some first and the culture. I think I see some first as a path to me contributing to a dying culture of stage shows in Jamaica. There was a time when you have at least 30, 40 shows, now they reduced to like three shows a year. And we do what we can. And we learn in the process of how to make it better. So, you know, there's a lot going on in terms of the business aspect. I know that I have to create generational wealth. So I'm not sticking to music to, 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 to put food on my table. I am made, mm-hmm. I've made other... Your trucking company. Mm-hmm. So forth. But I take a back... I put a lot of that on the back seat just to focus on construction and the music now. So that's, what I, that's where I'm at. 
Scatter, this was absolutely awesome and I could not have you here without you dropping some gems for persons who are listening and they, are, they have an aspiration to be a producer like a Scatter Burrell, but they are stuck on their path. That Their life is not as divinely orchestrated as yours, contrary to your religious beliefs. But what advice would you give to those persons who are listening? You know what? Don't let nobody tell you that anything is better than you. And you can't achieve nothing that you have a genuine. You have to be honest with yourself first, though. Is this something that I really want for the right reasons? And if you ask yourself that question, then you can eliminate hype. And you're left with passion and the zeal for just to be a part of something that you love. Don't let no one tell you to stop. And you have to do everything within your power to educate yourself on that. Because once you provide something for the world, you know, you're of use. So if you are if you know you can provide good production and you can do the best you can in this and you can make success out of it, just push on through. And you have YouTube, you have so many tools at your disposal now that we never have. So YouTube is the greatest teacher to me right now. The internet is there. Use it for the right purpose. Don't look upon people at work. Look upon people who can show you how to put you in the work. You understand me? And teach yourself, uplift the brain and be humble. And be honest with yourself in the process. Forget about hype, because hype not put you in nowhere. If you do things for hype, it will never manifest into nothing good. Trust me on that. Wow. Scatter Burrell, thank you so much. And we're going to be calling you for part two. Respect Kashima, man. It was a great honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. Look here. Where the time run gone and in between the commercials and everything. Really happy that we were able to make it happen. But we're going to have a part two for 